On December 26th of 1960, the Green Bay Packers lost a lead late in the fourth quarter, and they would be defeated by the Philadelphia Eagles in the NFL championship game. They almost got there. And so as you can imagine, those players in the offseason, they were so ready for the next season to start, ready for training camp so that they could start to build on where they had left off the years before when they almost won the NFL championship game. But legendary coach Vince Lombardi, he didn't pick up where they left off the last year. Instead, he went back to the very beginning. He walked in on the first day of training camp in July of 1961, and he held a football in his right hand. He said, gentlemen, this is a football. His focus on the fundamentals would carry all the way through training camp that year. He would teach them again how to block how to tackle, how to do the very basic things. They opened up the playbook and they started on page one. It was so slow that at one point, uh, the Pro Bowl receiver, Max McGee, joked, he said, Coach, you're going to have to slow down. You're going too fast for us. They said that Vince Lombardi looked up and he smiled and then he went right back to teaching the basics. He became famous for focusing on the things that everyone else took for granted. Now, that would turn into amazing success. In December of 1961, they blew out the New York Giants 37 to nothing to win the NFL championship. He would go on to win five NFL championships over a span of seven years, including three in a row. They would never have a losing season. He is now a legendary coach that focuses or that focused on the fundamentals. In fact, he had so much success that the Super Bowl trophy is now called what? The Lombardi Trophy, named after him. Well, today we're kicking off a brand new sermon series called Beyond Belief, The Journey to Discipleship, where we're going to kind of take a, 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 just a playbook from legendary coach Vince Lombardi, and we're going to go back to the very big basics of what it looks like to be a disciple. And so if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, you can go ahead and open those up to Matthew chapter 25. For the last several weeks before Easter, we had been challenging you to grow deeper in your faith. We had been really issuing a challenge to go from decided to disciples. That's the, the word we were using. And I'm so excited about some of you. Man, I've heard some stories about ways that your families are really growing, your marriages are really growing, your relationships are really growing. And some of you, as you realized during that series, that you kind of stuck in the category of decided and never moved to disciple, that you decided to follow Jesus. Maybe that was a few months ago. Maybe that was many years ago. Maybe you were baptized and you come to church, but you never really moved forward from there. And so we told you during that series that really being a disciple means that following Jesus should impact every single aspect of your life. And as we wrapped up that series, I was really excited about hearing some stories about growth but some of you guys had some real legitimate questions that you ask about that. Uh, one lady, she said, so you guys made me feel really guilty, but I don't know what to do. <laughs> I don't know what to change. I don't know how to live differently. I don't even know exactly how to get started. And I don't know how to measure whether I'm having success as a disciple if I'm moving from decided to disciple. And I thought, man, that is a great question. Some of you guys may be coming into today, if you were here for that last series, and you have taken some big steps in moving forward in your relationship with Jesus. But some of you guys, maybe you are right where that person was and you're saying, okay, I felt a little guilty, but, but I don't really know what to do. Another person said to me, it all feels so complex that I don't know really what I'm supposed to do because there's so many component parts to it and I don't know how to get started. And so for the next five weeks, we're going to talk about the fundamentals of following Jesus. In other words, the blocking and tackling of our Christian faith. Now, I know that some of you guys hear about a fundamental series and you go, oh, no, not again. And it's true. Some of you have heard this over the years many times. But as legendary coach Vince Lombardi showed us, it can, focusing on the basic can turn you into champions, right? Those professional football players, they knew what a football was. They had been playing football since they were little kids. And if we refocus on the basics, on the fundamentals, we will grow in our relationship. Well, next week, we're going to start breaking down the different aspects of what I call the five fundamentals of growing in your Christian faith. But today, I want to get even more simple than that. 
I want to talk about what does it mean to be a disciple? What does that even look like? How do I get started? In other words, if I were going to be Vince Lombardi, I would say, here is discipleship. And so let's look at what that is together. There's a big church word that we use sometimes called sanctification. I want us to look at that. Sanctification is the process of becoming a disciple. In other words, like we talked about, moving from the category of decided to the category of disciples. And sanctification comes from the Greek word hagiosmos, which meant to set apart for special use. And so this idea of sanctification is what does it look like to follow Jesus? See, over time, if you're following Jesus, you ought to start to think more like Jesus, to talk more like Jesus, to live more like Jesus. You know, Jesus spent a lot of time talking about what it looked like to be his follower. That was a whole lot of his teaching. And he would also give examples, and he would use these illustrations that we call parables. And and parables are made-up stories that teach an important truth. And so I want to show you what a parable is. Parable is, in its simple form, is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. The, The Greek word that the word parable comes from is parabole, and it literally means to cast one thing up against another. In other words, to make a comparison between two things for the purposes of teaching truth. And so what Jesus would do so often is he would compare something that he called the kingdom of heaven with other things. And he would tell these parables to show what the kingdom of heaven is look like. In other words, how do I live in this kingdom? How do I become discipled? How do I become sanctified? And so he would say things like the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed or the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. Or the kingdom of heaven is like leavening yeast. And so he would cast these things or compare these things to one another to help us see what it looks like to be his disciples. And one of those parables that he used is called the parable of the ten virgins or the ten bridesmaids. And it's a parable that's not used all that often. You may not have heard teaching on this particular parable. But it's a great parable for this idea of sanctification or discipleship because it's talking about a wedding ceremony and a wedding. And the reality is the marriage relationship is a great illustration or picture of what it looks like to be in relationship with Jesus. Jesus would often call himself the bridegroom, and he would call his church or his followers the bridesmaids. And because we have this intimate relationship where he knows everything about us. And so he would use that illustration. In fact, when Jesus returns at the end of time and we gather with him for a reunion in the sky, that reunion is called the wedding supper of the Lamb. And so we get this beautiful illustration of marriage. And we see that in this parable. Well, with that in mind, let's get started with Matthew 25, 1. At that time, Jesus is talking about here the end of time when he returns, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. So a more modern translation of that would be ten bridesmaids. And the way weddings would work back then, it was really cool, the bridesmaids would gather together basically for a party. And then when the the bridegroom would show up at some point in time, the bridesmaids would all go out with their lamps and they would light the path for the bridegroom to find his bride. And that's what we see happening here. So think about this like a bachelorette party. They celebrate for a few days. And part of the excitement was that the bridesmaids and the bride don't know exactly when the groom's going to show up. So someone will come in just a little bit before he gets there and say, the groom is on his way. And so the bridesmaids would all get their lamps and they would go outside and they would light the path for him to arrive. All right, let's look at verses 2 through 13. It says, five of them were foolish and five were wise. That sounds about right to me. If you have a a bachelorette party, there's going to be about half that are going to do some really dumb things and half that are probably going to do the right thing, right? That sounds about right to me, but let's keep going. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out. Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, hey, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. 
Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. And then he's talking to his listeners here. He's talking to us. He says, therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. So these bridesmaids, they have one job, (laughs) one responsibility at the party. They are to get ready, and when the bridegroom shows up, to go out and light his path to get to his bride. But they're having such a good time at the party that they forget. They don't have enough oil. And, and notice that they all had their oil lamps. They all looked the same, but, but they didn't have enough oil. And so the, the groom is lo- a long time in coming. They all fall asleep, and then someone comes and says, hey, the groom is here. And they realize they don't have enough olive oil in their lamps. As you read the story, you can almost hear the desperation in their voices. They're like, hey, hey give us some of your oil. We, we don't have enough. But the wise bridesmaids said, no, 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 we've just got enough. We, we, we prepared. Maybe you can run out and buy some oil from somebody that sells the oil. And so they go out to buy the oil. But while they're gone, the groom shows up. The party starts without them. And they get back and the doors are closed and locked. And they're banging on the doors saying, let us in. But the Lord of the house says, hey, I, I don't even know you guys. And then he says, Jesus says, so keep watch because you don't know the day or the hour. Now, the problem in this story isn't the punctuality of the groom, because part of this, the way this worked is he would take several days, and they just partied till he got there. It was an exciting time. The problem is the lack of preparation by the five foolish bridesmaids. Like, they're having such a good time at the party that they didn't think about the one job that they really had. And so when he shows up, they're they're not ready. So they looked like the the wise bridesmaids. They had their lamps just the same way. The difference wasn't on the outside. The difference was what was on the inside. They didn't have enough oil for their lamp. They weren't prepared. And so when the bridegroom shows up, they weren't ready. And then Jesus is saying, that's how it's going to be for us at the end of time, that there'll be people who look like they're ready. They're kind of doing the same thing that the, the, the people that are ready are, that they're hanging out with the bridal party, but they're not ready on the inside. And and it's interesting in this parable that all ten bridesmaids fall asleep. Did you notice that? Not just the five who were foolish, but the wise bridesmaids fell asleep as well. And so what Jesus is saying here is when he says falling asleep, that's a euphemism for death. And so Jesus is saying that we have to prepare for the return of the the bridegroom. We have to prepare for Jesus' return during this one lifetime. We get this one opportunity to prepare the wise bridesmaids. Bridesmaids were prepared before they fell asleep. The foolish bridesmaids were not. The five bridesmaids that weren't ready, it's, we need to be clear here, they were not evil. This is not the parable of the evil bridesmaids. They were just foolish. They, they thought they had more time than they did. They just got distracted by the party. And I think there's something about this life that does that with the sanctification process. There's busyness of this life. There's the troubles of this life. There's the the fun of this life, all the different things that distract us in the party. And so sanctification kind of gets lost in the shuffle. Foolish people say things like, look, I I was going to do that. Or look, I I just haven't gotten around to it. They, They have good intentions a lot of the time. They just think they've got more time than they really do. There was nothing worse in college than being tied to a group project with somebody who waited till the last minute. Do you ever remember that? I just, yeah, I distinctly remember how frustrating that was. The person, they weren't evil. They just thought they could wait till the last minute, get it done, and get it done well. And then they'd run out of time, and you had to decide, are we going to do their part of the project as well, or are we just going to take a bad grade because they didn't do their part? They, they, they had good intentions. They just got so caught up that they didn't follow through on their responsibility. And so Jesus is using this parable to remind us, don't get distracted by the party. No, you have one responsibility that is primary, and that's to be prepared for Jesus' return. So I told you this was going to be a very practical sermon, and it is. And so I'm going to spend the rest of this sermon talking about three practical questions for sanctification. In other words, how do I move from decided to disciple, or to put it in line with this parable, what do I need to be doing to prepare myself for Jesus' return? And and so we're going to answer these three practical questions. Here's the first one. 
what does the process of sanctification look like? And then the second one is, what are the specific areas of sanctification that I need to focus on? And the last is, how do I know if I'm making progress in sanctification? So those are the three questions that we're going to answer today. And so let's turn to the first one. What does the process of sanctification look like? This parable or this illustration of a wedding is a beautiful illustration of what it looks like to grow in sanctification because our relationship with Jesus looks a whole lot like a marriage relationship. And so if we think about the wedding as the moment we decided to follow Jesus, the rest of our life we're going to live out the sanctification process of growing in relationship with him. So let me use that illustration of my marriage to Lil. Almost 35 years ago, we got married, and at the wedding ceremony, I was all in, right? I mean, I wasn't trying to think about how do I get around some of these vows. I wasn't trying to look for loopholes in my commitments. I wasn't trying to think about what are the ways that I can maximize the benefit I get out of this marriage without doing any work to make it good for her either. No, no. In my heart, I was all in. I was ready to go. I was ready to be the perfect husband. I had good intentions, <laughs> but I had no idea what that looked like. And so I messed up and I made mistakes and I've spent 35 years becoming the husband that Lil deserves. Now, let me be clear. I'm still not the husband that Lil deserves. I still have things that I struggle with. My heart is the same today as it was 35 years ago. I want to be a good husband for her, but I don't always make progress in that but I can look back over time and see that I have made progress in that. So my heart is all in, and over time, there have been periods where I did made really big strides in growing as a husband. And man, I was was making big steps. There have been other times where, you know, the distractions of life, and I got made less progress, but I still had that all-in heart. I just wasn't making the progress that I made at other periods of time. Now, I want to separate all of that where my heart was right and I'm just making, having different levels of success from a period of about seven years early on in our marriage. If you've been around very long, you've heard me talk about a very difficult struggle we had pretty early on where I wasn't all in. My heart wasn't right. I didn't care to grow in my marriage because I was growing as an attorney. That was what was most important to me. I wanted to make lots of money. But then I changed my heart and I began to refocus on giving Lil the importance that she deserved, and then I began to make progress again. And so if I look back, I'm a better husband today than I was a year ago, five years ago, and certainly better than I was 25 years ago. Now, there's still points in time where I take a step backwards, I don't do what I'm supposed to do, or I kind of stagnate for a little while, but I can look and see that I'm making progress in living and being the husband that she deserves. Do you you see the difference between having a heart that's all in and the results of that and how much progress you're making? The same thing happens in our relationship with Jesus. When we follow Jesus, let's consider that kind of the wedding ceremony. If we follow him correctly, the Bible says we're all in and we are ready to give our lives to him and serve him. But over time, we then learn what that looks like. We have periods where we do a better job of growing in that relationship than others. And so preparing for Jesus' return means that we work through this process of sanctification and we grow in relationship. I'm a work in progress in my marriage. I'm not where I need to be. I love my wife desperately, but I'm not the husband she deserves yet. I'm still working at that. I'm a work in progress when it comes to my relationship with Jesus. I love him desperately. I'm all in in my heart, but I'm still not where I want to go. And I won't be there until the day I die and I see Jesus face to face. But I should be a better disciple today than I was five years ago. And I should be a better disciple two years from now than I am today. Does that make sense? That's how you view this relationship. The heart flows out into living for Jesus. All right, here's the second practical question. What are the specific areas of sanctification that I need to focus on? Right? There's no magic formula to growing in relationship with Jesus. I want to be clear about that. And if you read the Bible, there's lots of things, and that's where that question came from of somebody saying there's a lot of stuff. But there are five very basic things that, that Jesus talks about, that the New Testament writers talk about, that are foundational for 
relationship with Jesus, that are foundational for sanctification. Consider this the blocking and tackling of sanctification. So let's look at those five different areas. They are consistent prayer, generosity with time and talents, generosity with resources, making and growing disciples, and Bible knowledge. Those are great places. If you say, I want to get started, I don't know where to start, what can I do? That's it right there. That's the five basics. That's the blocking and tackling of Christian faith or sanctification. All right, so let's focus on these, and we are going to focus each week on different, the, one of these areas. But today we're just kind of give, give, give an overview of that because I want you to help you understand generally what it looks like. So let's start with pray regularly. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I get asked all the time, what's God's will for my life? There it is, right there. (laughs) The Bible says it. Pray continually. Marriage is a beautiful illustration of how this works. If you want to grow in relationship with your husband or grow in relationship with your wife, one of the most important things to do is what? Communicate, talk. The same thing is true with Jesus. If we want to grow in relationship with Jesus, we need to talk to him. Uh, It it doesn't have to be complex. I think you get confused and think, man, there's these perfect words I've got to use. There's this, you know, it's got to be long. It's got to be, you know, certain things. No, no, no. Just talk to him. Pray for the things. Tell him what's going on in your life. Tell him the good things and give him thanks for that. Tell him about the bad things and ask for his help. Pray for your friends and family and coworkers that don't know Jesus. Pray for the people that you know that are struggling or hurting or dealing with sickness. Just talk to God. We're going to dive into this topic of prayer next week a lot deeper. And I can't wait for you to see the video of a young mom in our church who's really growing in her faith recently. And a big part of that is her prayer. But what you're going to see is her prayer is so simple. It is so just talking to God. She tells God what's going on, what she wants, what she needs, what she's struggling with. And you're going to get to hear an example of that. And, and I think it's such a beautiful thing to see how simple and direct prayer is. It's what prayer does. It's just talking to God. See, I, I think there's a tendency for us not to pray until things go south on us, right? When things are good, we're not really praying. It, we think about it kind of like a food delivery service, like DoorDash. You don't call DoorDash until you need some food. You're hungry, need some food. We don't really call Jesus until we're desperate and need a miracle. But that's not how relationship grows. It doesn't work that way. Like if the only time you talk to your neighbor is when you need to borrow his ladder, y'all are not going to have a relationship. He's going to be a little irritated every time you give him a call because he knows why you're calling. Growing in relationship means regular communication with God. So pray regularly. Pray every day. Doesn't have to be long. Doesn't have to be complex. But pray and you'll start to see your relationship with Jesus grow. All right, here's another area where you should be growing. Generosity with your time and talents. Our mission statement here at Kara City is that we want to show intentional grace to others one person at a time. And here's why we do that. We believe that if we love and serve other people and we show them intentional grace in a unique and different way, they're going to want to find out why we're doing it. And we earn the right to share the truth of Jesus with them. And that truth can change their lives. Now, what you may not know is that you're part of that mission. If you are a Christian here at Karis City Church, you're an important part of that mission. Look at what Paul says in Ephesians 2.10. He says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are a church on a mission and you are part of that mission. Let me be clear. Church is not a place. Church is not a particular time of the week. Church is a people who are gathered together to worship God and then go out on a mission to transform the world around them. That's what church is. And I think people who see church as a place tend to think more about being served than serving. They they show up for church. Their kids show up for programming, for children's programming or student programming. And look, as long as we meet their expectations and their their needs and their desires, they're pretty happy with the church that they go to. But understanding what church is changes you from being decided to being discipled because you understand that church 
isn't a place. Church is a group of people on a mission. And when you realize that, man, you will start to make progress in going from decided to discipled. You'll grow in sanctification. Jesus set the example to say, I didn't come to this earth to be served. I came to serve. And if we're disciples, we follow the master. And so we follow that example. And when you do that, it begins to change things for you. So if you're wondering how you're doing in this area, let me have you ask yourself this question. Do I see church as a place I go? Or do I see church as a group of people on a mission that I'm a part of? All right, here's the next area. Generosity with resources. I think for some of us, giving back to God is a four-letter word. We get real uncomfortable when anybody says giving. And we, we kind of, you know, we cross our arms and we're, we're pretty unhappy. We wish we hadn't have come to church that day. And I think we get frustrated with this because we have a basic misunderstanding of who owns our stuff. And some of you are already going, I know who owns my stuff. I earn my stuff. I own it. But the Bible is very clear that that's not true, that, that God owns your stuff. You may have earned that money, but God gave you the talents the desire. He put you in the right place, gave you the opportunities. And if you think you own your stuff, that would be really inconsistent with what God has to say about your stuff. Look at what the Old Testament says in Psalm 24.1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. God's saying, I own everything. But if that's not specific enough to your money, look at Haggai 2.8. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. God says, I own it. You don't. I let you use it And I want you to be generous back to me with it. And so what you need to understand is that you don't own your stuff. And and when you get that understanding, you really take a big step from decided to discipled. Because suddenly, talking about giving in church makes perfect sense. Because we're talking about God's money. And God then wants you to show him your love by your generosity back to him. So God doesn't need your money. Let's be clear about that. And let me let you in on a little secret. If he needed your money, he'd just take it. Like he built the universe. He can do that. That's not what he's interested in. He wants your heart. But he understands that there is a connection between how tightly we hold on to our money and how much we love him. Let me give you an example. When my kids were little, they would buy me birthday presents for my birthday. Whose money were they using? Mine. Right? They didn't have money. They didn't earn money. But they would go out with their mom and they would buy me a present. And sometimes it was awesome and they put some thought into it. Sometimes it was a toy that they liked. (laughs) But every time it brought me joy. Not because I didn't own the money. Because they were showing me their love. Does that make sense? They were being generous with me. That's how God views our money. Listen to how Jesus says this in Matthew 6, 19 through 21. He says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasure in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is saying, what you do with your money tells you a lot about what you truly love. Are you all in in your heart? All right, here's the next area where you need to focus on to become more sanctified. Making and growing disciples. The way Christianity spread from Jerusalem and Israel halfway around the world to Katy, Texas, is because individual Christians and the churches were passionate about sharing the good news of Jesus. And and that was the mission that that Jesus gave them. We call it the Great Commission. Just before Jesus went back to heaven, after he had died and rose from the dead, his very last command that he gave to his followers was found in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. And we call it the Great Commission or the joint mission that we have with Jesus. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He says that really there's two parts to this. The first part is making disciples, sharing the good news of Jesus so that other people follow him. And then we baptize those disciples. When somebody decides to follow Jesus, we baptize them just like the Great Commission tells us to do. That's the first part. And then the second part is teaching them. In other words, helping them in the sanctification process that you're working through. Help grow them, encourage them. And so let's look at the first part. If we really want to see our church reach people who are lost, we've got to do a better job as individuals of sharing our faith. 
We, we've got to share our faith, tell them what Jesus has done for us. We've got to invite people to church. We've got to offer to pray for people and tell them why we think that's important. As a staff, we spend countless hours coming up with ways to get people to come here to hear the good news. But you know the number one reason why people still come to our church? Because somebody invited them. It's the number one reason people come to our church. It's the number one reason that people go to any church. Someone cared enough to invite them. And so you ought to be sharing our stuff on social media and with a personal invite. Tell them about what you found here at Kara City, how Jesus has affected you. You need to be inviting friends and coworkers and family and people you don't like to church because it's that important. Because if you believe what Jesus says about heaven and hell, you begin to understand how critical this mission is. It's not comfortable to think about, but Jesus could not be more clear. The decision we make in this life to either follow him or not follow him decides where we'll spend eternity. And so that's why this great commission is so important. And that's the first part, share your faith. The second part is teaching them. In other words, helping them through the sanctification process. When we follow Jesus and we live together in community as a church, part of our responsibility is to encourage one another, to challenge one another, sometimes to confront one another about things to help us grow in sanctification. Listen to how the writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. He says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. That's the day of Jesus' return when the bridegroom comes up the path. We have a responsibility to encourage other Christians, to develop relationships with them, to challenge them. And, and, And I hear so often people will say when we're talking about community groups or Bible studies or a social event, someone will say, what am I going to get out of it? And I would tell you, if you want to move from decided to discipled, you're asking the wrong question. The right question is not, what will I get out of it? The right question is, how can I help someone else grow? How can I be a friend to someone else so that they become more sanctified and look more like Jesus? Such a big deal. Here's the last area we need to focus on in sanctification. Grow in Bible knowledge. To live more like Jesus, and we got to know how he lived. If we want to talk more like Jesus, we've got to see how we talk. We've got to understand the Bible. The Bible is, in, in many ways, it's an instruction manual for how to live with God, what he likes, what he doesn't like. And man, I wish that was the case from wives, right? Wouldn't it be awesome, guys, to have an instruction manual where you could flip to page 73 and go, got it. Like, I think page one of the instruction manual would just be a big picture of a husband smiling, lowering the, the toilet seat. And the next picture would be him sleeping in the bed and not on the couch, right? But there isn't an instruction manual for my wife. I know, I looked, I can't find one. You know one, tell me. (laughs) But there is for Jesus. See, when when I got married to Lil, I knew there were some rules that I was agreeing to. There were the basics, the fundamentals of blocking and tackling a marriage. I knew that I was supposed to love her unconditionally, that I was supposed to support her when she's healthy and things are going well. But I'm also supposed to take care of her when she's not healthy and things are not going as well. I I was supposed to support her and be excited about our relationship when we got plenty of money to pay all our bills. But I was also supposed to be excited about our relationship even when we struggled. I'm supposed to love her until death parts us. Those were the rules I knew. Those are the ones I specifically agreed to. But there were other rules that we'll call it the fine print of the marriage contract. Maybe it was on the back of my marriage license and I didn't flip it over. But I've learned a lot of other rules over time that I didn't know. Here's one, and if you're a young husband, you know it. It scares you to death. You have to answer this question. Does this make me look fat? (laughs) There's a related question that's almost as bad. Do do anybody know it? Does this look Good. good on me? Yeah. Those are questions that strike fear into all of us because you think there's a right answer. It seems obvious, but you mess it up. And not only do you have to give the right answer, but you've got to withstand vigorous cross-examination on the topic. And you realize you didn't know the right answer that you thought you knew. There's another one about posting pictures of your wife on social media. I've learned that I can't just post a picture. I have to run it by her. There's some artistic approval process. I don't understand it at all, but I'm told that's the case. And so I have to get her permission. And over time, 
I've learned new ways to be a better husband. I've learned through trial and error. But we have this beautiful thing for Jesus called the Bible that tells us how we can get a better understanding of what he likes, what he doesn't like, what things are important to him, so that we can begin to align our priorities with his. That's why understanding the Bible is so important to the sanctification process. So here are the five areas again. Consistent prayer, generosity with time and talents, generosity with resources, making and growing disciples, and Bible knowledge. We're going to dive deeper into those over the next few weeks. All right, here's the last practical area. How do I know if I'm making progress in sanctification? I got this comment from somebody after our last series. I, I never know if I'm pleasing God, that if I'm doing enough right to please God. Did anybody ever have that thought? Yeah, it, it raises this question. How do I know if I'm making progress in sanctification? And you think about this the exact same way you think about a marriage relationship or a relationship with boyfriend or girlfriend or a relationship with friends, any relationship where you have to put some effort and work into. How do you evaluate how it's going? Is it better today than it was last week? Is it better now than it was two years ago? Are we making progress? I think so often we try to evaluate how we're doing in sanctification by looking at somebody else. We look at somebody who seems to have it more together and be more sanctified than us, and we feel kind of guilty that we're not doing enough. Or, or we'll look at somebody that's not doing as much as us, and we go, we are awesome. That's not how you evaluate sanctification. Look at these five areas. How are you doing today compared to a month ago? How are you doing compared to five years ago? 10 years ago. Do you see the process? And and so what you look at is, how does it work? Am I living out my heart? Am I doing my best to do that? Look, you're not always going to get it right. You're going to mess up sometimes. But am I making progress? That's how you evaluate that. And if you're growing in your relationship, man, you can be encouraged about that and continue to grow. If you're not, something to work on, something to, to change. Sanctification isn't about earning God's approval. I cannot be more clear about that. You cannot earn God's approval. You cannot do enough stuff to earn God's approval. God's approval, being his child, is not about what you do. It's about what was done for you. Jesus took care of that. He took care of that on the cross. That's what made you worthy for God. The strength of our relationship with Jesus is all about here. It's about the oil on the inside. It's what's in our heart. That's what he's looking for, right? When you got married, that wedding ceremony, that was the commitment of all in. But man, you're going to spend the rest of your life trying to get it right. Sanctification answers the question of what was done for you on your wedding day, so to speak. In other words, when you decided to follow Jesus, you received this incredible grace that you don't deserve. And and sanctification is, how do you respond to that? Well, you respond by living for Jesus, trying your very best to live out what he calls you to do. Sanctification, it just answers the question of how do you respond to the incredible grace that you've been shown. Let me say that again because I think that's so important. Sanctification in its most basic form is simply the rational response for how you respond to God's grace. Paul put it this way in Romans 12, 1. He says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. This is the response. Up to this point, Paul has spent 11 chapters talking about how we are saved by faith through God's grace. And then here in chapter 12, he makes a hard transition with the word therefore. And he says, because of all of that, here's how you live life. It's just a rational response to God's grace. See, we don't become sanctified to earn God's favor. Sanctification is all about living out and understanding of how thankful we are for God's mercy and grace. That's what it looks like to be a disciple. Let's pray.